Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we're going to learn how to compute the sample size when using monetary unit sampling. So the formula is on the screen in front of you, but before I start, I want to make sure that you viewed the prior recording. So if you go to my YouTube channel playlist under complete auditing course, there's a prior session about monetary unit sampling basically an introduction part one. So basically this session technically is part two. So part two is how to compute the sample. So let's look at the formula first before we proceed any further. So this is how we compute the sample size because in the prior session, we just work with the sample size, but I told you, I will show you later how to compute the sample size and later as now. So here's the formula. We're gonna take a confidence factor confidence factor in the numerator, divide the confidence factor by the denominator, which is the tolerable misstatement as a percentage of the population. Notice it's a percentage, okay? So we're gonna look at the confidence factor. Now, before we proceed any further, here's a few things we would like to see. What happens if your confidence factor goes up? Your sample size is gonna go up, okay? So think about it, if you take 10 divided by 2, it's going to give you 5. If you take 12 divided by 2, it's going to give you 6. So as you increase your confidence factor, your population will go up. Okay, and confidence, how, com how much confident do you want to be? You need to look for at more information. Now, let's look at the denominator. If we say 10 divided by 2 equal to 5, if we take 10 divided by 5, if we increase it equal to 2. So as our tolerable misstatement as a percentage of the population goes down, the sample size goes up. So simply put, the higher the confidence factor, the higher the sample. So they, go, they have a direct relationship. So confidence factor and N, they have a D, a direct relationship. They work the same way. If one goes up, the other one goes up. If one goes down, the other one goes down. When it comes to TM, percentage of the population, what did we notice? If we have a higher number, the sample size goes down, which we have what we call the inverse relationship. When one goes up, the other one goes down. This is just a brief introduction. Now we're going to go through the steps to get to the confidence factor because this confidence factor is coming from a table and we get to the, get to the confidence factor, we have to determine a few things. So what affect the sample size? Let's go ahead and get started because this is what we need to look at, what affect the sample size. So the first thing we want to look at is we want to determine our acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance. So acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance. You remember that term? That term is basically saying, what's the chances that if we make it, uh, make a statement about the financial statements, we could be wrong, we could be wrong. So we could say, yes, the financial statements are good, but they were no good. So what risk are we willing to take? Now, how do we determine this acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance? Well, we at that point, we have looked at the internal control, we have assessed the internal control, and we, we used our professional judgment. So for the purpose of our example, we're going to use 10%. 10% means what? Means, in other words, we are 90% confident about our sample. If, if this is the 10% of acceptance risk of incorrect, uh, the acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance. So we are 90% confident that we're going to be right, but we're still taking 10% chance. The other thing that we need in order to calculate the sample size is the population. And basically the population, where do we find the population? Which basically we look at the client's record and hopefully they have all everything recorded. So we're going to be dealing with account receivable of a $5 million population. That's fine. The next thing we need to look at is the tolerable misstatement. What is the tolerable misstatement? Again, let me show it to you on a um, some sort of a graph here. So the tolerable misstatement, so this is 150,000. So how much misstatement, this is zero. So how much misstatement we will find that's below the tolerable misstatement and we could still say that the account is fairly stated. So tolerable misstatement is how much can we tolerate? And here we're, we're gonna say 150. How do you determine the 150? It's based on prior period or based on your professional judgment, okay? Now the next thing we're gonna look at is something called tolerable misstatement as a percentage of the population. Now this is basically a computation. How do we compute the tolerable misstatement as a percentage of the calculation? Well. As, as it state, tolerable misstatement as a percent 
as a percent of the population, it happens to be 3%. And if you notice here, we use this 3% in the denominator. Do you guys see this? So we're, now we got to the tolerable misstatement as a percentage of population, okay? Next thing we do, we need to estimate the population misstatement. And how? what's the estimate the population misstatements? It means how much do we think the population include errors? Estimated population misstatement. Do we really know how much? We don't. And the only way to know is to compute to audit this 5 million. If we audit the whole 5 million, then we will find out what is the what's the population misstatement. Notice this is an estimated amount. We think there is $15,000 error in the population, but we can tolerate up to 150, but we think that's only 15, okay? How do we know the 15,000? How, how did we estimate this based on prior results, based on our professional judgment, okay? Because once you estimate, that's what you're using, professional judgment. The next thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at the ratio of estimated population misstatement to tolerable misstatement. Well, basically, take the estimated population divided by the tolerable misstatement. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you, before, actually, before we proceed any further, I think I, I skip over things that I should have went over. Let's go to step two. What happened if you have a population of 10 million, 5 million? What happened if your population goes up? Let's assume you're dealing with a population of 10 million rather than 5 million. How does N is affected? Well, if you're dealing with higher population, generally speaking, generally speaking, N should be higher. Generally speaking, it's not proportional. So if you go from 5 million to 10 million, you don't have to, you don't have to double your size. But generally speaking, generally speaking, as your population goes up, your sample size goes up. Let's go back to this one here, step one. Okay, the acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance. What happened if we want to change this from 10% increase it to 20 percent well if we are if we are willing to accept more risk then we have to do less work and we'll go down if we'll take this five ten percent and make it five or let's make it one percent now we only want we want to be 99 percent confident so it's only one percent we're setting this risk at one percent if we want to be 99 percent confident we're going to have to have a large large sample because we're going to we want to be we want to be confident so what does that mean the way area and sample risk works. If you increase area, you could reduce your sample risk and the opposite is true. Same thing with tolerable misstatement. Not the same thing, let's explain tolerable misstatement. Let's not make a general statement. Tolerable misstatement versus N. Now the tolerable misstatement is 150. What happened if I increase my tolerable misstatement to 200,000? I can tolerate more mistakes. I can bring my sample size because I can tolerate more mistakes. If I can only tolerate 100,000 in mistakes, then I have to do more work because my tolerance is very low. Okay, and the rest will drive, will drive the, those three factors will drive down your sample size. So I, don't mean, I kind of skipped over this. I think that's important to mention. Okay, so step six, compute the ratio of estimated population misstatement, 15,000 divided by the tolerable misstatement. That's 0.1, we're gonna need this figure later. Then now we have to find the confidence factor. You remember we took the confidence factor divided by point, uh, point zero 0.03 to find the sample size. How do we find the confidence factor? Well, we're gonna have to find the confidence factor from a table given a 10% acceptable risk of incorrect acceptance and the expected tolerable misstatement of 0.1. So let's go to the table. And here's the table. So this is a, the so this is the uh, confidence factor for monetary unit sampling and we're dealing with a 10% 10% risk of incorrect acceptance. And the ratio the ratio of expected to tolerable misstatement is 10%, so we're dealing with this, 10%, actually both 10%. Therefore the confidence factor is 2.77. Okay, now let me show you this. I just want to show you this. If you go from 10, if you want to take more risk, your your uh, your confidence factor notice will go down. If you want to take more risk, your confidence factor goes down. What happens is if your confidence, if your if your numerator goes down, your sample risk goes, uh, your your sample goes down. And notice if you want to go from 10% to 5%, giving the same information. Sorry, it just keep on start to skip now notice your confidence factor goes up if your confidence factor goes up then your sample size goes down and notice notice also if your expected to tolerable misstatement 
goes up, which is notice goes from 10 to 15, okay, your risk factor goes up, which in turn, um, your numerator goes up, your numerator goes up, okay? And if you go from 10 to 5, from 10% 10, 10 to 5% of the ratio of expected to tolerable, your um, your risk, uh, your uh, your confidence factor goes down to 2.52. So make sure you understand those relationships. We just explained them earlier, but this is you can see them clearly on the table. So now we so we we figure out the confidence factor is 2.77 at this point. Uh, calculate the sample size. The sample size is again confidence factor divided by 3%. Okay, so those two figures, let's eliminate everything except those two. So notice we did all this work to get to the sample size. So we get to the confidence, we take the confidence level divided by 3%. The sample size is 93. Then we still have one step to undertake and that's find the, comp uh, the uh, calculate the sampling interval. And what's the sampling interval? You'll take the total, total population divided by, by 93 and you'll find the sampling interval. And we did use the sampling interval in the prior session. Once we have the sampling interval, we're gonna go to the population and start to collect you know, the items that we need now. Now this step, how to collect the items, this was in the previous session previous session on, on how to use the sampling interval to collect the items because in the previous session basically we started by saying the sample size is 93 the confidence uh, the sampling interval is 53,763 find the items here we, we I showed you how to find the sample size and what affect the sample size and how to compute the interval so this is a good hopefully those steps are uh, are very beneficial in understanding how to compute the sample size and on the cpa exam what they try to do they'll try to not they'll try to test you on if you know the relationship between area and the sample size the recorded value and the sample size the tolerable misstatement and the sample size okay now the rest are basically computation but you need to know those relationship the one that i thought i skipped then i can i went back and i and i covered the module so um, the next thing we're going to look at is I'm going to look at uh, the side on the acceptability of the population. So the next thing we look at, we look at the misstatement bound, how to compute the misstatement bound and how to make a decision. So basically we'll, we'll just keep on working, but I'm breaking this into small steps. This way it's easier than just going through the whole thing all at once. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means, email me. If you're studying for your CPA exam, Study hard, it's worth it. Good luck.